All right, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we are gonna go ahead and get started. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host tonight, Heather Cook, and I'm a sophomore at the College of Worcester studying history and political science. And I work at the Barringer Crawford Museum as a visitor service as associate um, while I'm not in school. And tonight I am joining you live from my dorm in Worcester, Ohio. Uh, Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of the Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. Foundation, as well as our members. And if you're not yet a member of the museum, you can please consider joining us and you can get access to discounts and exclusive programming. You can learn more about that at our website, which is bcamuseum.org. Um, you can get information and join there. And that's also showed down at the bottom of the screen there. Before we begin, we're gonna go over a few reminders. If you have a question or comment to share, you can type it into the chat or the Q&A feature. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. There will also be a trivia question tonight and the first respondent to answer, enter a correct answer to that in the chat on Zoom or on Facebook Live will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour prize and most importantly, bragging rights. And so that question is actually, an enslaved woman sought escape from a farm in Boone County in 1856. What was her name and how did she escape? So try to figure out the answer to that and maybe you'll win. Um, and so let's go ahead and meet tonight's speaker. Rick Pender is an award-winning arts journalist, editor, theater critic, and occasionally urban tour guide. He's been writing about local history, arts, and culture for more than 30 years. A graduate of Oberlin College with advanced degrees from Case Western University, he came to Cincinnati in 1980 to promote classical music station WGUC, then launched WNKU, Northern Kentucky University's NPR station. He is an ardent ad admirer of the region's many cultural attractions, Rick is also the author of 100 Things to Do in Cincinnati Before You Die and co-author of the Cincinnati Bengals, an illustrated timeline, a history of the NFL franchise. Welcome, Rick. And if you're ready, you can go ahead and begin. Well, good evening, everyone. I, uh, am I looking okay there, Heather? Yep, you look great. I think I need to do one more thing here. There we go. So thank you for that, uh, that introduction. Um, this is going to be a talk that is based on my book called Oldest Cincinnati. Uh, but I have narrowed the focus uh, for uh, for this history hour. Uh, my book is a collection of about 90 historic things that are still to be experienced across northern Kentucky and southwest Ohio. In the late 18th century, people began coming here in search of new frontiers and new lives. Uh, the Ohio River played a major role in opening the West, as it was called. It still seems strange to us today to think of this as the West, but our neck of the woods uh, really was the West when most of the people in the United States at that time lived on the East Coast. Um, we were an attractive place because of our verdant river valley that became a mecca for waves of German immigrants who gravitated here, drawn by the climate and the topography that resembled the Rhine River Valley in Bavaria in Germany, where many of them came from. The Ohio River is the reason that the cities of Newport and Covington and Bellevue, Dayton and Ludlow, as well as Cincinnati, are situated here. Its existence played a major part in the development of our region. The river and its bridges belong to Kentucky. That's because in 1792, that's the year that Kentucky became a state, um, the federal government determined that Kentucky owned the river along its border with Ohio, 
Indiana, and Illinois. In essence, the boundary between Kentucky and these three future states is the 1792 low point of the Ohio River's northernmost bank. Much of our history is linked to the Ohio River, which both divides us and unites us. But I wanna start by going back a little bit further in time. So in, uh, in fact, this is about 16 uh, millennia ago. So in Union, Kentucky, there is evidence of creatures that walked the earth more than 16,000 years ago. In the 1770s, a man named Nicholas Cresswell found fossilized bones that he described as being of prodigious size. He found tusk fragments and teeth, one of which weighed 10 pounds. He called the place the Big Elephant Lick. Over the years, Big Bone Lick State Park came to be thought of as the site where American paleontology began. Um, it was established in 1960, uh, the park was, and listed in 1972 on the National Register of Historic Places, and it is in Union, Kentucky. Those bones that he unearthed were Ice Age, uh, from the Ice Age, they belong to woolly mammoths. They're also uh, in that general area, remains of mastodons, bison, caribou, deer, moose, and musk ox. They were drawn by a salt lick that was created by sulfur springs. And the swampy surrounding land trapped these animals with no way to escape. You can see in this diorama uh, with the boardwalk overlooking it uh, that uh, these animals waded in and then got stuck there. Uh, the Parks Visitor Center has exhibits of fossils, both indoors and outside, including a half-ton mastodon skull. They were, those were very big beasts. There are trails to explore the park, this boardwalk that you see here in this diorama around a marsh bog, and there are lots of interpretive panels. So it's an interesting place. They also maintain an American bison herd there that's viewable year-round, um, and those bison are descendants of some of these Poor guys who got stuck in the muck there. So let's jump a few thousand years uh, further to the future and take a look. And uh, here are some uh, buffalo or bison. Uh, what you're seeing here, this is actually one of the panels that is on the uh, the the flood wall by the suspension bridge. These are the Roebling murals there adjacent to the uh, Roebling Bridge. And uh, in the upper left of that image is the uh, Licking River flowing into the Ohio. So it is really the confluence of these two rivers that more or less created the, the basin that all of our northern Kentucky cities and Cincinnati sit in. But before roamed uh, across the plains in Ohio, uh, around 10,000 BC or so, uh, they migrated south uh, in the cold weather, like, like we talk about the birds doing now. And they crossed the Ohio River at this shallow ford where the rivers two came together. So it was only a few feet deep in the fall when uh, the river was at a very low point. Um, one might say that they were the region's first traffic engineers because they established a path for the Dixie Highway today. That's, you know, US 127, 42, and 25. Um, you can see them memorialized in this mural, but there they are going across. If you also look at the tiny figures that are more or less in the center, that's a few indigenous people who've carved off one of the animals from the uh, their ford and are, you know, are, are uh, hunting it uh, for uh, for meat and uh, hides and things like that that they that they might use. So let's move on to the next. Uh, how did uh, people start coming here? This was a long time after those buffalo, but. Uh, the first way that people came here, some, some folks uh, in Kentucky came up from Virginia, from the South overland, but more and more people started coming down the Ohio River on flatboats. So Kentucky was the, uh, the 15th state to enter the Union. Uh, homes began uh, in the 1790s on the South Bank of the Ohio at the point. Uh, near the, the, oh, the river's intersection with the Licking River. 
Covington was laid out in 1815. It was named in honor of General uh, Leonard Wales Covington, who trained troops right around here uh, in, uh, around the time of the War of 1812, and he actually died in that war. More and more settlers arrived uh, as the 18th century and 19th century uh, began, and they came by these flatboats. Now, these had no form of propulsion. They just flowed down with the current of the river. They did have some ability to steer and maybe be pulled off to the shore. You see the, the guys on the top with the long poles. So that was a way that they could guide, uh, guide this. But you see they had room for stock on board. Uh, they had a, a canoe alongside if they needed to take a short trip somewhere. Not very luxurious accommodation, but uh, it is the way a lot of folks came down here, at least in the first decades of the of the 19th century. By uh, 1830, Covington had a population of 715, but it was soon to be uh, amplified considerably by German immigrants. By 1840, the population there was up to 2,026, and in 1870, it was nearly 43,000. That's not too different from where it stands today. Uh, there was a time early in the 20th century when Covington's population was around 65,000, but it seems to have settled down these days in sort of the mid 40,000s. Across the river, the first Ohio settlement was briefly named Los Santaville, which is a kind of a funny cobbled together name that meant, uh, according to the person who coined it, the city opposite the mouth of the Licking River. The letter L was for Licking. The OS is the Latin word for mouth. Uh, anti means opposite and vil means city. So there you have it. In 1789, Fort Washington was built on the Ohio side. It was generally outfitted with a garrison of about 300 soldiers, and it was commanded by uh, General Arthur St. Clair, who was the first governor of the Northwest Territory. And he's the one who renamed the city Cincinnati after the Society of the Cincinnati, which was a Revolutionary War Officer's Order that honored George Washington. By 1820, Cincinnati was clearly the gateway to the West. It had a population of about 10,000 people then. People were also at that time needing to go back and forth across the river. There were no bridges. So the, the really the only way would be to take a boat. And so ferries became the sort of thing that uh, many people did. And down in Augusta, Kentucky, uh, upstream on the Ohio River, uh, the very first of the ferries uh, started operations there in 1798. Uh, it is the oldest continuously operating ferry service between Kentucky and Ohio. Uh, that's about 45 miles east on the river. A man named John Bowdy began to shuttle passengers uh, back and forth using a hand-propelled ferry on April 2nd, 1798, just a few months after that town of Augusta was chartered by the Kentucky legislature. Service continues there today, and it's now diesel-powered, uh, and it's called the Jenny Ann. Uh, it transports people and vehicles to the south shore on Augusta's Seminary Street, or, which is Kentucky Route 8, uh, to a landing on, on, the, uh, on the north side uh, near, uh, it's just a little bit west of Higginsport, Ohio, on US 52. It's the only public river crossing for a 55-mile stretch between Cincinnati and Maysville, Kentucky. If you want to put your car on it, it costs five dollars. And if there's a paying vehicle on board uh, and you just want to hop on on foot, you, you can ride for free. Now, this next one is one that that I learned uh, after my book was published, because I have something in my book about Procter and Gamble being one of our older manufacturers, but they were uh, really uh, started uh, about 20 years after this company called Atkins and Pierce. Uh, so they were a manufacturer of, uh, today they're a manufacturer of technical textiles, but they started in 1817 with a modification of the cotton gin. And in 1861, they, they really got into this be, uh, by braiding candle wicks. 
and they probably work closely eventually with uh, uh, the Proctors of Procter and Gamble who were candle makers. Uh, candles that Procter and Gamble made were a by, used a byproduct called tallow from all the pork processing that was going on in Cincinnati at the time. Uh, the, uh, the, it's still a family owned company. And while it was in downtown Cincinnati originally, um, it is now a, it's a seventh generation owned company and it's located in Covington. Um, they still make thousands of candle wicks, but they also uh, are a pioneer in textile processing of glass fiber that's used in things like Kevlar and Teflon and Gore-Tex. And interestingly, in the 1940s, they began uh, developing parachute cords that were used during World War II. So there you see there that that would be on the Ohio side of the river back back in the day uh, called Pierce's Factory, but Atkins and Pierce was the name of that uh, of that company. So another early means of travel. Uh, that connected Lake Erie all the way down to the Ohio River and to the Licking River was the uh, Miami and Erie Canal. This ran from Toledo uh, on the western end of Lake Erie all the way down through Cincinnati. What you're seeing uh, here is uh, more or less uh, what is Central Parkway. You're looking east on Central Parkway, that hilltop uh, beyond there, uh, the, the build, building with a little tower on it is the art museum, not uh, much foliage on the, on the trees and on the hill, on the hill there at that point in time. Uh, that uh, was commissioned, the, uh, the canal was commissioned uh, by the General Assembly of Ohio in the early 1800s. Construction of it began in 1825 on a leg that ran from Cincinnati to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and it used a 66 mile path that was conceived by Dr. Daniel Drake, another historic figure who spent time in Kentucky and in Ohio, uh, principally a medical doctor, but he had his fingers in all kinds of activities and is uh, often thought of as one of the founders of the University of Cincinnati and its College of Law and its College of Medicine. Um, he was, oh, and he was the founder of what was then called the Western Museum, which is the Natural History Museum at the Cincinnati Museum Center today. Uh, in Cincinnati, too, I like to mention this, the canal was traversed by some small bridges. You see one there uh, over there, with, which actually has a streetcar running across it. The densely populated German immigrant neighborhood north of downtown was jokingly called over the Rhine as if this narrow canal was Cincinnati's miniature version of Germany's Rhine River. As we all know today, the that name stuck and we still have uh, over the Rhine. And of course, a lot of goods that came down the canal uh, made their way farther south via the Licking River uh, or also on the uh, Covington Georgetown Turnpike, which had opened in 1819. Slavery was uh, something that still existed here through the, much of the, the 19th century. The oldest remnant of that that can still be seen um, is at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in downtown Cincinnati. And it is this building that you see in the picture. It is a 20, 21 foot by 30 foot slave pen that was recovered from a farm in Mason County, Kentucky. That's just about 60 miles from, from where we live now. It is the oldest locust, local remnant of slavery. It was built around 1830. The structure was used as a holding pen by Captain John W. Anderson, who was a slave trader. He bought his farmstead in 1825 and was active in the slave trade in the 1830s. He held enslaved people in the pen until he had at least 30 to take to market in Mississippi or Louisiana. They would be boarded on a boat and taken down, down the river to that part of the country. Most people auctioned there were forced into backbreaking work at cotton plantations. Male slaves were kept on the pen's upper floor inhumanely shackled to rings that prevented their escape. Women and children were held on the pen's lower floor. The very few windows that are 
and that were covered with iron bars, uh, but left open to the elements. Anderson died in 1835 while chasing a runaway slave. He had made a small fortune, which financed his uh, horse breeding business. Uh, I will mention the, the Freedom Center, which opened in 2004, tells lots of stories about freedom's heroes, enabling visitors to better understand the painful realities of slavery and injustice from the era of the Underground Railroad right up to the present moment. It's called a Museum of Conscience, and it's rather like the United States Holocaust Museum and some of the other history museums in Washington, D.C., now, this one is not in my book, but I got to thinking today, I'm talking about stuff in Northern Kentucky. And what is the oldest church in Northern Kentucky? I thought about the Cathedral Basilica, but I thought, no, that that's, that's, wasn't built until the very early 20th century. So I did a little digging around and here's what I found. St. John the Baptist Roman Catholic Church, which is located on Johns Hill Road in Campbell County, was established as a initially as a log house that was built by nine German immigrant families who came from Bavaria in 1847. It also served as a school for their children. Mass was celebrated there on the fourth Sunday of the month by the pastor of Newport's Corpus Christi Church. However, during a parish picnic uh, in 1857, lightning struck the log building and it burned to the ground. In short order, a more substantial structure was built on the site. That's what you're seeing in the photograph here. It's two stories tall. It's made of something referred to as rubble stone and topped with a bell tower. It was dedicated on November 25th of 1858 and uh, is still in use today. It uh, has none of the ornamentation that we think of with some of the fancier churches that were built later in the 19th century. In fact, I think it symbolizes the uh, rather simple religious life that was led by those early German immigrants who came here. Over the years, this also served as a mission statement uh, station that was run by the Benedictine Fathers of Covington. Uh, its Golden Jubilee, its 50th anniversary, was celebrated in 1908. And by 1917, the catechism was no longer taught in German language due to anti-German sentiment there during World War I. The Sisters of Notre Dame uh, had assumed charge of the school there in 1909, and they often performed most of the custodial work themselves, recruiting students occasionally to help out. In 1938, it became a more vibrant parish, and some physical improvements to the sanctuary were made in 1941. If you ever find your way into the church and sit in the pews, you will be sitting in pews that are from the original church back in the 1850s. It was entered on the uh, National Register of Historic Places in 1980. Well, this is one we all know, the, uh, the Roebling Suspension Bridge. I thought you might enjoy seeing uh, an historic photo. Um, you can see that it, it, this goes back more or less to the period when, the, when it was just opening. Um, there are river boats, uh, steamboats uh, pulled up on both sides there. This is from the, uh, I believe this is from the Kentucky side, looking across the river. That would be Cincinnati on the far side. That's the public landing over there. And the high ground in the right side of the photo would be uh, Mount Adams uh, to the east of downtown Cincinnati. So John Roebling was born in Mulhausen, Prussia, uh, he immigrated at the age of 25 to the United States and became a civil engineer. He's most remembered as the uh, designer of the Brooklyn Bridge, which was built in 1883, but he got his start with this smaller but impressive structure, which was originally called the Cincinnati Covington Bridge, a, a pretty apt description of what it was. It was a prototype for the Brooklyn span. But today it's named in Roebling's honor. It is the John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge. It was the first permanent bridge across the Ohio River. It was completed in 1866, right after the Civil War. And it was the longest suspension bridge in the world 
at the time. It is uh, Greater Cincinnati's oldest bridge. Construction began on it about 10 years earlier than that, but it stalled in 1857 when there was a bank panic, uh, wrangling between political leaders in Ohio and Kentucky. Fancy that, wrangling between Ohio and Kentucky public leaders. Imagine that. They, but what they were arguing about then was aligning downtown streets between Cincinnati and Covington. The folks on the Cincinnati side were apparently afraid if it was a straight shot across the river that everybody would run across the river to buy things in Covington. I don't think that worked out, but that's why the uh, streets are sort of offset uh, when you try to, if you take Ray Street from downtown Cincinnati, you kind of have to do a little hitch over uh, half a block to get it onto the, uh, onto the bridge, and that's why. Finally, in 1865, the 230 feet tall bridge towers were completed. During the Civil War, those were the, the structures were there, but there was no bridge between them. Uh, when the With the war going on, there were people who were concerned that if we had easy transport across the river, that the, the southern armies might come marching uh, across into Ohio. But it finally did open uh, in uh, 1866 uh, on December 2nd of that year. And uh, Amazingly, on the very first day, people walked across the Ohio River on that bridge, 120,000 people walked across. They each paid a penny to do it. So if you multiply that out, they made some fairly decent money. There was also a fare for horse-drawn vehicles uh, to go across there. Uh, during the 1937 Ohio River flood, which uh, did lots of damage on both the Ohio and the Kentucky side of the river, this bridge was the only one that was able to stay in use across the Ohio River between Cairo, Illinois, where the Ohio dumps into the Mississippi, and Steubenville, Ohio. It was a stretch of about 600 miles. Uh, folks in Covington sandbagged the approach to the bridge so people could still have access to it. So this was really the only crossover for vehicles to uh, to get across. As I said, it was originally built with horse-drawn vehicles in mind. Today, it's limited to cars. You can't put buses or trucks on it because they, uh, the weight would be more than the bridge was really designed for. Despite occasional closures and repairs, as we know recently with chunks of sandstone falling off, that bridge is a lasting, iconic symbol of the connections between Kentucky and Ohio. It became a National Historic Landmark in 1975, and it's probably the, the historic part of, of our region that more people recognize than, than anything else. However, there's something else that a lot of people recognize, but they might not quite know that it uh, is uh, also uh, one of the oldest, and that's that on uh, Cincinnati side, uh, but with fans on both sides of the river, the oldest professional baseball team. They were originally called the Cincinnati Red Stockings. They began to play in 1869. They were the world's first all professional baseball team. In their first season, they played 130 games, barnstorming around the U.S., and they won 130 games. Their original first-year record was 130 and zero. Not too much like the team that we had this past year. In 1912, the team moved to Crosley Field in Cincinnati's West End. Fans came from throughout the region, including Kentucky. In 1919, the team won the World Series, against the Chicago White Sox, but their title was tainted by the uh, renowned uh, Black Sox scandal when it was learned that several Chicago players threw the championship in exchange for money from gamblers. First Major League Baseball game played under lights happened at Crosley Field uh, on May 24th, 1935. The Reds played at Crosley until 1970 when Riverfront Stadium opened directly across from Covington and the mouth of the Licking River, where we saw those buffalo crossing over back then, and now it's just uh, baseball fans. Uh, Great American Ballpark opened just a little bit east of where Riverfront Stadium was in 2003.
The oldest county courthouse in the area is in Newport. It is the Campbell County Courthouse. It dates from 1884. If you're familiar with Music Hall in Over the Rhine, this looks a little bit like that. Uh, this isn't quite as fancy as Music Hall, but it has all that fancy frou-frou architectural detail that we know uh, from that high Victorian uh, period. It was built on the site of Campbell County's first two courthouses, one of which was a wood frame structure that was built in 1797 and, and then uh, replaced by a two-story brick building uh, that was built in 1815. This 1884 building is one of the largest and most architecturally distinctive courthouses uh, throughout Kentucky. It was designed by two architects, uh, A.C. Nash from Cincinnati and L.H. Wilson from Newport. And uh, it features that tall four-sided clock and bell tower, a lot of uh, masonry details. It has a beautiful marble staircase inside and an ornate uh, allegorical cathedral stained glass window. It was named to the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. Interestingly, Campbell County actually has two county seats. In 1840, Kentucky's General Assembly designated Alexandria, which is 12 miles south from Newport, as the official county seat, and an 1840 red brick courthouse was built there. It still holds many historic records, including papers signed by Daniel Boone and Henry Clay. In 1883, after lengthy lobbying and squabbling, the General Assembly allowed Newport to designate a courthouse district beyond Alexandria. It was not until 2010 that Newport was actually granted equal status with Alexandria. There are several other historic buildings of interest uh, in the general vicinity of the Campbell County Courthouse in Newport. Um, St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which is at York and Court Street, was built in 1874. And the Salem United Methodist Church, which is at 802 York Street, uh, as built in 1882. Um, that one you might know today because it has served as a uh, theater for the uh, community theater group called Footlighters. They call it today the uh, stained glass theater, and it's a lovely facility. The Cincinnati Art Museum is the oldest art museum west of the Allegheny Mountains. Again, that's because, you know, there were art museums on the East Coast, but uh, as civilization began to develop out this way, uh, folks thought we need an art museum here. And this was the first place that anything in the Wild West uh, uh, became an art museum. It's also the city's oldest year-round, Cincinnati's oldest year-round cultural institution. There was a Women's Museum Association that began in 1877, and they mounted exhibitions at Music Hall for a while. In 1881, plans were made to build a permanent museum in Eden Park with an adjacent art school. And that's the building that you see to the left of the art museum building. Now, that does not look much like the art museum today uh, because there have been wings added and more or less surrounding much of that. The, the, and the building that is the Art Academy there on the left is incorporated into the overall structure. And it is where the museum's library and its, uh, uh, some of its offices are located. So what's the Kentucky connection? Well, I thought you might be interested to know that the first head of the Art Academy was a painter named Thomas Satterwhite Noble. He was a native of Lexington, uh, where he was raised on a plantation. He trained in Louisville, uh, also in New York and Paris, before he came back to the United States in 1859. He was named the head of the Art Academy when it was established, uh, first called the McMicken School of Design uh, in Cincinnati in 1869. Uh, it became the Art Academy in 1887, and he served as its leader until 1904. He's buried in Spring Grove Cemetery on the Cincinnati side of the river. 
But there's another connection, Frank Duvenek, name some of you might know, uh, who was a native of Covington and uh, a renowned uh, artist, a painter. He was born in Covington in 1848. His family were German immigrants. In 1869, he went abroad to study at the Royal Academy of Munich. He was among a group of innovative artists who in the 1870s started a new movement that was characterized by a really bold, forceful painting style. He'd largely been ignored during his younger life in Covington, but his work in Europe was noticed and a lot of young students flocked to him there. He finally came back to the United States in 1888 uh, and lived in Covington until his death in 1919. Starting in 1890, he taught painting at the Art Academy and uh, he served uh, and succeeded uh, Thomas Satterwhite Noble as the school's head in 1905. Uh, Satterwhite passed away in 1904, uh, and Duvenek became the head of the school then and served there for 14 years until his own death in 1919. He's buried at Mother of God Cemetery in Covington, and um, if you find yourself at the intersection of Pike and Washington Streets there, you can see a life-sized uh, bronze statue of Frank Duvenek in a small park. The region's oldest amphitheater, not too far from Barringer Crawford. Our oldest amphitheater is in Davout Park in Covington. It opened in 1939. It was a Works Progress Administration or WPA construction project. The park itself has a panoramic view of the Cincinnati skyline and the Ohio River. It was once a family farm owned by William and Sarah DeVoe, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a couple of minutes. The band shell nestled in this grassy bowl uh, in the park's rolling hills is a versatile venue for weddings and receptions and award ceremonies and more. Its inaugural summer in 1939 uh, saw the, a crowd of 40,000 people turn out, uh, the largest that's ever been recorded in the park. That would make for a very crowded hillside there. Today, it's the home of the Kentucky Symphony Orchestra's popular summer series where concert goers spread out on the grassy hillside to picnic and enjoy the music. And of course, the park is home to the bear. Crawford Museum. Now, ours, and I suspect that some of you know uh, know a lot about it, maybe as much as I do. But let me just repeat some of the uh, some of the history because I think it's interesting. It offers uh, 450 million years of Northern Kentucky history and culture, some of which is viewed through the lens of transportation, rivers, roads, rails, runways. It's housed in William DeVoe's original 1848 residence. A Cincinnati milliner, DeVoe uh, left a will in 1910 that suggested that his house should become an art museum or a library. His son, William DeVoe Jr., lived in Cincinnati's West End and served as the family home's landlord. Uh, with funds from the WPA, the Work Projects Administration, he set up a trust fund for the ongoing upkeep of the house. His brother Charles lived there and became its first superintendent. When Charles died and the family moved to California, the city of Covington rented the home from the 1920s until 1943, when there was a fire that sort of put it out of commission for a while. But it came back to life again when Covington resident, builder, and world traveler William Berenger passed away. His family donated his natural history collection to establish a museum in the restored Davout home, which opened as the William Berenger Memorial Museum in 1950. Ellis Crawford was its first curator, and uh, and he was an archaeologist. He focused on Northern Kentucky's prehistoric cultures. He knew about fossils and helped create Big Bone Lick State Park, which I talked back 
talked about back at the beginning of this talk. A mastodon jawbone from the park is on display at the museum. When Crawford retired in 1970, after a long tenure there of 20 years, the city of Covington renamed it the Berenger Crawford Museum. One more bit of history. This is also a bit of shameless self-promotion on my part. Uh, the Bengals, they were started in 1968. And if you're interested in their history, I am the co-author of a book that's just been recently published. It is an illustrated timeline, lots of pictures. This is a coffee table uh, size book uh, that you might be interested in checking out. And where can you do that? I would recommend that you get your copy at uh, the Roebling Point Books and Coffee Shop, uh, which is at the south end of the Roebling Suspension Bridge. And if you've never been in that bookstore, I will tell you that it's a lovely place. Lots of books about Kentucky history and uh, all kinds of other wonderful books and, uh, and some pretty good coffee and such too. But it also, that building was where John Roebling had his office while the bridge was being built. So it's a, a historic site that you can also visit there. So with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up. I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, uh, hear comments that you might make. And maybe you know of something old that I've overlooked that, uh, that I'd love to hear more about. So uh, Heather, maybe you'll like to uh, take us back uh, for that conversation. stop sharing now there we go heather you're muted <laughs> yeah <laughs> um we've had a fair amount of comments about churches that predate what you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. but um before we get into that i'd like to go over the trivia question um we did have a winner for that but to repeat um the question was an enslaved woman sought escape from a farm in boone county in 1856 mm -hmm. What was her name and how did she escape? Um, and the answer to that was Margaret Garner and she walked across the Ohio River to escape. Um, and Mary Albers got that correct. Um, so congratulations to Mary. Um, would you like to talk about that at all? Maybe yeah, let me, let me say a little bit more. That was uh, 1856. Margaret Garner had been enslaved on a plantation that was about 20 miles south of Covington. And she... Uh, hated the whole concept of slavery. She had children. She really did not want them to be drawn into slavery. So that winter of 1856 was a very frozen time, and the Ohio River froze, and you could walk across it. It wasn't easy. It was treacherous. It was some broken ice, and you had to climb over chunks of it and that sort of thing. But she and her three children, her husband and uh, her husband's parents, uh, scrambled across the river. They went to a safe house on the Cincinnati side, and uh, sadly, a slave catcher was able to find them and uh, wrangle them up and uh, want to take them back. Margaret was so distraught over this uh, and re refused to consider the notion that her children would be taken back into slavery and uh, tried to kill them so that that would not happen to them. She succeeded in uh, in killing the the baby, the youngest of her children, before she was stopped from doing the others. She was taken back, <clears throat> excuse me, I get choked up talking about Margaret Garner. Um, she was taken back into slavery, um, was on the farm for a couple of years, was then sent uh, to a plantation, I think in Louisiana, and she uh, she passed away not too long after that. So she led a rather sad life. I should also add that if some of this sounds familiar to you, it's be for two reasons. One is that uh, Toni Morrison, uh, the uh, noteworthy African-American novelist, wrote a book called Beloved, which is uh, very much based in that. It is, the, it is a ghost story, and it is the ghost of, the, of Margaret Garner's baby who was murdered, um, who is a, sort of a central figure in that story. And the 
story of Margaret Garner was turned into an opera that was presented by Cincinnati Opera about uh, about 20 years ago in the early 2000s. So uh, that's, the, that's the story of Margaret Garner. Also, she is uh, one of the subjects of the murals, the Roebling murals uh, that are on the flood wall uh, in, in Covington there adjacent to the suspension bridge. And you can see her and her family scrambling across the, uh, the ice on the river. Yeah, that's really interesting and such an empowering story to hear about her. Um, but to go from that, um, I'd like to talk about some of the comments people left um, about churches. Some people mentioned um, Corpus Christi Church in Newport and Big Bone Baptist Church um, near Big Bone Lick. Um, and didn't know if you were aware of those or not, um, put their locations in the chat. Thank you. What was the second one I got Corpus Christi? Um, Big Bone Baptist Church. Okay. I did that research very hurriedly, and I knew that that one that I talked about was certainly one of the oldest, but I sort of had a feeling that people might know a little bit more uh, about some of those, so I will definitely look into, into that. I know that Corpus Christi was mentioned that a priest from there uh, did conduct the masses at the uh, the, the one uh, on John's John's Hill Road. So I figured he had to come from somewhere. He must have had a church. So. Yeah, and looking back a little bit further in the chat, someone else mentioned the Bellevue Baptist Church as well. It was okay. in a log cabin. I wonder if it's still there. Um, part of the premise of my oldest Cincinnati book and many of these things that I'm talking about is that they are things that you can still visit. You can still go mm -hmm. and see one way or another. So um, if it was, uh, and I don't know about that 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 church, if it was in a log cabin, if it's still there, um, uh, you know, it would be something that I would want to look into. So mm -hmm. I'll check on that. And we did have so far, one question come in and I'd like to remind people if you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the chat while we still have some time. Um, but somebody was wondering if there was a gallows in front of the Newport Courthouse until recent times, and they seem to remember there being one when they were a child. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case, but I don't have that detail of knowledge. Uh, maybe someone else who's uh, tuned in uh, would know the answer to that. I know that there were executions on the Cincinnati side of the river, uh, and so there were probably gallows there. So, you know, this that since the courthouse there was built in 1884, it'd certainly be a period when, when that was a form of execution. Yeah. Um, Martha, we see that your hand is being raised. If you'd like to drop your question or comment in the chat, we can get to it that way. Um, and if anybody else would like to drop some questions in the chat, we'd love to hear them. Um, but right now, there isn't any more questions at this moment yet. So is there anything else you'd like to um, talk about a little bit until somebody gets some questions? Oh, we did have one just come in. Um, they said this isn't an oldest question, but can you speak about um, Morgan's Raiders? Maybe. Um, I am aware of Morgan's Raiders. That one is uh, beyond my uh, my research. I mean, those were uh, a, a, it was a small Confederate uh, band of uh, soldiers who uh, came across the Ohio River into Southwest Ohio and were sort of uh, marauders uh, going around and terrorizing communities. Then, but beyond that, I that's uh, not something that I have a lot of detailed knowledge of. Until any more questions come in, is there anything else you uh, would like to touch on a little bit, maybe go into more detail about what you talked about or anything else? Well, let me see. <clears throat> you know, I again, it's not part of my book, but I think that some of the, uh, the schools and educational institutions on the Kentucky side of the river are certainly worthy of, uh, of note. Uh, I, as you mentioned, 
in my introduction. I spent some time working at Northern Kentucky University, which is not certainly not the oldest educational institution there, but uh, uh, Thomas More College has an interesting history. It was originally called Villa Madonna College, and so that's uh, uh, one that was certainly around. I don't have those all those dates in my in my head, but uh, and then I'm sure that there were uh, uh, public schools, uh, Covington Catholic. Uh, uh, and uh, Covington Latin schools were probably started, uh, you know, well, at least early in the uh, 20th century. So uh, those would be some that I would mention. And we did get some questions come in. Um, when and why was the canal filled in? <laughs> uh, it's because trains started providing a much more rapid form of transportation. The uh, the canals in on the uh, in Ohio there was the the uh, Miami the Erie Canal and then there was also the a canal in eastern Ohio that that connected down through the eastern part of the state but as rail started running in the 1850s 60s and 70s it was a much faster way to move things the moving a, a, a boat along the canal it took you know two weeks to go from Toledo to Cincinnati, whereas a train could make that trip in a, in a day. So that's the, the principal reason. It was just technology advanced and it was uh, uh, something that wasn't needed. And a lot of you probably know that they, so they did fill in the canal uh, on the uh, Cincinnati side. They, uh, and then they dug it up again with the idea that there was going to be a subway uh, connecting downtown Cincinnati out to some of the uh, the northern suburbs. And uh, but then another advance in transportation happened with uh, uh, cars, and people didn't feel they really needed a subway. This was happening in around the time of World War One, so things kind of stopped because of the war. And then with uh, people having automobiles. Uh, Subway didn't seem like something that was needed. So they filled it in again and it's uh, Central Parkway today. Um, someone else was wondering um, what the 3L and 3L highway stood for. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> and um, if you knew of any- It might be something like Lexington, Louisville and Latonia, I don't, I don't yeah. know. I'm making that up, so. <laughs> oh, Latonia, Lexington, and Louisville, yeah. Oh, all right, well, okay, so I win that trivia prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someone else is wondering if you knew of any oldest cemeteries. Um, I do not. I have information in the book about some of the older cemeteries um, in Ohio, including Spring Grove, which is quite quite the historic cemetery, and a lot of famous people are buried there. Um, the fact that uh, uh, Frank Dubinek is buried at the Mother of God Cemetery says to me that it's probably uh, historic there in, in Covington. And I would think that some of the older churches certainly have cemeteries that would be would be historic but again that was not not part of my my book the the most historic cemeteries in the area that I'm aware of are uh, out in the area of Lunkin Airport and that's sort of where the very first uh, Ohio settlers came and landed but since there were people in Kentucky at that time they were probably being buried somewhere I don't I don't know where those were and if it was a formal cemetery or just in family plots or something like that. Yeah, Janine Kreinberger, archaeologist, just said that several church cemeteries in Boone County date back to the very early 19th century. So thank you, Janine, for that. Um, yes, and, thank you. Um, and then how did you get interested in um, researching the oldest things in the area and your book? Well, let me tell, I'll, let me, I'll be very frank about this. The, uh, I had done a book already called A Hundred Things to Do in Cincinnati. And uh, I had a lot of fun with that book. That's a uh, like a bucket list of fun stuff to do. It has some historical stuff in it, but that was not the, the crux of that book. And the publisher of that book uh, came to me and said that in that book, there are many editions of A Hundred Things to Do in various American cities. They, they have well over a hundred uh, editions of that book. 
So then they came to me and said they were starting another line uh, that they were going to call oldest, whatever, oldest Chicago, oldest St. Louis. And they asked if uh, sort of based on what I had done with my hundred things, uh, if I would be interested in doing this. And it was in uh, uh, early 2020 when I was asked to do it. And I tell people now it was my my COVID project since I was locked down and couldn't really go out and do a lot. I had a lot of books about local history that I was able to look things up in. And of course, with a computer, you can look a lot up online. And that's how I did much of my, my research. I also went out and uh, once the world opened up a little bit more, I shot a lot of the photos that are used in the, the book. That one's fairly extensively illustrated. Uh, if you're interested in seeing pictures of some of these things, perhaps before you go to visit them. Um. <clears throat> And it is almost 7.30, and that was the last question. So I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. We like to remind everyone that Holly Jolly Days is going on now at BCM with the Irving Berlin's White Christmas, the exhibit. Our holiday toy trains is back this year and an interactive Lego display and play area by the um, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Lego Union Group and our Winter Wonderland light display is outdoors in nature play this year again for its second year. And the family centered fun and attractions they run through January 8th and are included with museum admission. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to our website, which is bcmuseum.org. Um, for more info and a complete list of all of the upcoming activities that we have going on. This Saturday, December 3rd at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., we have a special Frosty Fun Craft. You can create a Frosty Hat centerpiece the whole family will enjoy. Include it with a museum admission, but you must have a reservation. You can call 859-491-4003 um, and RSVP for one of the two sessions today. Um, and there will also be a White Christmas Gallery Tour that day at 1 p.m. through Irving Berlin's White Christmas, the exhibit. It's a great way to see the exhibit and learn about each piece on display from a museum staff member. The tour is also included with museum admission. Last but certainly not least, we are very excited about our upcoming magic show, Before Your Very Eyes, with certified hypnotist and master magician, Ron Diamond. You can join us for an evening of illusion and delight at the Reedland Shock Community Room at the Kenzie County Administration Building on December 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. with doors opening at 5 p.m. Tickets and registration are required and you can get your tickets now by calling 859-491-4003. Um, as a reminder, there will not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour throughout December, but we will be back in the new year on January 11th 2023. And that's all we have for this evening. So thank you again to all of our sponsors and supporters of BCM. Thanks to our staff, trustees, and members of the Barrington Crawford Museum. For more Northern, Northern Kentucky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, where you can find the latest installment of our curator's chat with our curator of collections, Jason French, Please like and subscribe on all of those videos and platforms. And until then, take care, everyone, and good night. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Rick. My pleasure. <laughs>